So last time, uh, this is our what third lecture on psychrometrics, and we talked about dry air, moist air, saturated air. We have a good feeling for that. We have our dry bulb, our wet bulb, and our dew point temperature, so three temperatures, and we have two humidities. What is the definition of the relative humidity? There you go. It's the partial, actual partial pressure of the water vapor in the moist air mixture divided by the maximum, which would be if it would be saturated vapor. And so I like to use PSAT there. It's at the same temperature, and often they're at the same pressure. I mean, really, we talk about relative humidity in the context of air like we're breathing and living in and, and that, so it's atmospheric air. You can have the definition of relative humidity for air that's at much higher pressure, but usually we think of just atmospheric pressure. Okay. The other humidity I said the engineers like, the mechanical engineers like. It's called the humidity ratio, omega. What is that defined as? Exactly right. But when you say mass of water or mass of vapor divided by the mass of air, you have to be real clear. Is it the dry air? Yes, exactly. It's the dry air. And so that's the dry air, because sometimes they'll say, oh, that's the moist air mixture. No, nope. you normalize it with respect to the dry air. Show that the humidity ratio can be expressed as a constant, 0.622, times PV divided by P minus PV. First of all, what is exactly PV? Partial pressure of the water vapor in the moist air mixture. What is exactly P? the total mixture pressure. And is it true that P is equal to PV plus PDA? And this is the dry air partial pressure. This is the vapor partial pressure. This is the total gas pressure. So really, sometimes they may just replace this down here by PDA. Yeah, the pressure of the dry air. Okay, so this constant, 0.622, will work it out. But it looks kind of funny first time you see it. But it, it's, it's a constant a lot of people in this business of uh, dealing with uh, moist air and psychrometrics know very well. Okay, let's do it. So, so there's the definition. If I divide by volume, I really have that it's the density of the vapor divided by the density of dry air. I like to use the ideal gas equation. A version of it is the pressure times the volume equal to the mass, R bar divided by the molar mass, T, or P is equal to rho R bar over the molar mass T, or rho is equal to P molar mass divided by R bar T. So you just have to get really good if you haven't already at manipulating the ideal gas equation. Oh, I want to use it to express the density of something. So the density of the vapor would be replaced by the pressure of the vapor, the molar mass of the vapor, divided by R bar T. And then how about the density of dry air? Well, would it be the pressure of the dry air, molar mass of the dry air, divided by R bar T? What can we cancel? The R bar T's. And right away you see that this is the molar mass of vapor divided by molar mass of dry air times partial pressure of vapor divided by the partial pressure of dry air or the molar mass of vapor, molar mass of dry air, PV divided by P minus PV. Didn't we get there? So now you can see what is that 0.6. Two, two. Yeah, it's the ratio of molar masses. So if you take the 18.02 for the molar mass of water vapor, 28.97, you'll get 0 0.622 with some change. So that's where it comes from. Very good. Very good. We use this equation quite a bit. This, this is a nice equation to quickly get to the humidity ratio, to make a calculation of the humidity ratio. 
Last time we set up this problem, so I'll kind of go through it quickly. So we have moist air at 40 degrees C, 100 kilopascal, and 75% relative humidity. It's contained in a 2.5 cubic meter closed rigid tank. The tank contents are cooled, but they're cooled from a high temperature of 40 to a low temperature 35. That's for part A. Let's worry about part A. You would apply the first law of thermodynamics to the rigid tank, focusing on the contents of the rigid tank, which have both vapor components as well as dry air. And the amount of cooling, and I'm going to change the direction of Q, 1 to 2, so it's really from initial state 1 to final state 2, but it's coming out of the system. I don't want to, that negative sign will get in the way, would be the mass of dry air times the internal energy, uh, uh, initial, well, it, this is the, uh, it, it's going to be a, a 1 is a higher and 2 is the lower internal energy of the dry air, and that will be a positive out. And then we have the mass of the vapor times U1 minus U2 of the vapor. Okay, let's solve just for part A first. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to show, or you can definitely show that uh, it doesn't condense. But when you cool it all the way to 30, some will condense. Okay, so, uh, so how do I get these values for the internal energy? Well, you, you want to use the air tables. which is table A22, and this one U1 is, is evaluated at a temperature of 313 Kelvin. Sorry, but you'll have to do some interpolation. And 335 degrees is the, 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 at, at 308 Kelvin. You can do some interpolation, and you'll pick up that the internal energy U1 comes in at 2, 2, 3, 0.41 minus 219.82. And we have to calculate that mass of the dry air. But come over here, what about these changes in internal energy of the vapor? Well, use table A2. And so you look up this uh, at U1 is now at 40 degrees C. Table A2 uses temperature of in degree C, not in Kelvin. And you look up that this is 2430.1 oh, kilojoules per kilogram and 2423.4 and that's at the, the different temperature 35 degrees C. So those are those are the UGs. It's the internal energy of the saturated vapor. All right, now we need to get those masses. Well, how do we calculate the mass of the dry air? Mass of the dry air is like uh, the volume of the tank divided by the density. We just worked out that for an ideal gas. Dry air behaves as an ideal gas. So let me write it like that. So we have the volume. We have the pressure of the dry air, the molar mass of the dry air divided by the universal gas constant and the temperature. Yes, sir? You can do that too. Um, I here I use the table A22, or you use uh, C sub V times T1 minus T2. It's just a little challenge to get that C sub V. You can get it, no problem. So, um, actually I do it both ways on the next two slides. One with C sub Vs and the other with the U's. Okay? Yes? Either way. Uh, either way, and uh, you just, and so I'm not grading this to three and four significant digits. Either you kind of got it right or you didn't. You know, you're, you're not, you're, you can't be truncating in the calculation. 
But if you go down the road of specific heats, you're going to get a slightly different answer than the road of U's. So, so uh, you need to get on the path and get, do it correctly on that path. But when you get on that path, again, make sure that you're not somehow... Students will still do that at this level in the class. It's, it astonishes me. They will truncate a number to two significant digits in some intermediate calculations, and then later pop it out with five. The final answer is now five. Like, I don't think you know what you're doing. You can't do that. So uh, that you will lose points on. OK. So let's do this. Let's calculate the mass. Well, first of all, I have to get the, the density of the pressure, the partial pressure. Well, the partial pressure of the dry air is the total gas pressure much the vapor pressure. What's the vapor pressure? The relative humidity times the saturation pressure at that 40 degrees C, at 40 degrees C. And you can actually then calculate the mass of the vapor using the same PV. Well, let me put the volume first. The volume of the tank, partial pressure of the vapor in the tank, the molar mass of the vapor, R bar T. So I think you can calculate those masses. Let me give them to you. This first mass for the, let's see, vapor, will come in at 0 0.0959 kilograms. And for the dry air, 2.63 kilograms. OK. <clears throat> so when you make this calculation, you find that the total amount of heat removed for part A is a combination of 9.44 kilojoules to cool the dry air, plus 0.64 uh, kilojoules to cool the vapor, and it's a total of 10.1 kilojoules. The vast majority of it is cooling the dry air because that's the majority of what you're cooling, the vast majority. Okay. Now, how about to go for part B? Well, in part B, the cooling is you'll have the mass of dry air, which doesn't change between part A and part B. It's the same amount. But you'll have the initial minus the final. I'm going to call it state 3 because it's a lower temperature than state 2. So I should put Q 1 to 3, shouldn't I? 1 to 3. And then we're going to take the, the split it. And this is kind of one way of doing it is I'm going to bust it into two components for the water. And I'm going to say some of it will definitely turn to liquid. And that, that liquid, it starts as vapor at state 1, and it ends as liquid at state 3. And so this is going to be U sub G at 1. This is U sub F at 3. It's liquid at state 3, which a temperature of 30 degrees C. All right. And then what starts vapor and ends vapor will be U1 um, minus U3 for the vapor. This is for the dry air. OK, so again, we're going to use table A22 for these values. Uh, you'll pick up the 2.63 for the mass of the dry air. You'll have the start. U, U1 is the same, 223.41. And unfortunately, you have to do interpolation 216.23 for the ending. A little bit of work here. How do I get the mass of the vapor at the end? You could definitely do a mass balance, but I would do this. Is I would just do it like I did over here. But um, at state 3, what is the vapor pressure? It's going to be 100% relative humidity. It's going to be the saturation. And so it's, it's going to be P sat at the 30. And I should have given you some numbers. They're on the next page. But the, the P sat at 30 degrees gives me, if I can find it in my notes here, well, maybe I have it only on the next page. Uh, 4.246 kPa, where before 
it was 5.538 kPa. So it used to be a larger partial pressure because it was more vapor. You cooled it off, and now some of it had to condense, and it does condense. So you calculate the mass of the vapor that remains at the end at state 3, and it comes out to be 0 0.0759 kilograms, where before it was almost 0.1, so 0 0.0959 so this becomes 0 0.0759, and the difference then is what turned into liquid is 0 0.0201 kilograms. That mass balance lets you calculate the liquid. All right. So let me throw in some numbers here. For uh, U1, that's going to be the same. That's the 2430.1 minus. Now you go use of... Use of G at that lower temperature, uh, 2416.6, and this is 2430.1 minus, and then use of F at that uh, 30 degrees is 125.78. So when we do the sum of those three numbers, the first number is 18.88 uh, uh, kilojoules, 1.2. Uh, 97 kilojoules and 46.06 kilojoules so the sum q1 to 3 is around 66 point something kilojoules and when you and go back and evaluate it it's uh, around 28 percent of the heat removed is to cool the dry air and only around two percent is to cool the vapor that stays vapor and around 70% is what is cooling the, which starts out initially as vapor but ends to be condensate. So, what does it say about this 70%? There's a whole lot of uh, heat removal needed when you're cooling moist air and you have condensation forming. The, it takes a lot. Yeah, for, for the phase change. And from practical experience, if you ever live, let's say, in a place like Houston, and you're running the air conditioner on a very hot, humid day, it has to work hard. And if you go outside, you can see the, just the water dribbling, the condensate dribbling. And that takes a lot of energy to out of the air, the moist air, to get that condensate to cool it off. If you ever go to, let's say, El Paso or Albuquerque or someplace where it's dry, Air conditioner runs, no condensate on the coil, and it's a lot cheaper. It, it's easier. Less heat is removed to drop the temperature of that dry air because you have no condensation. Here it is, worked out with the CVs. Now, I have Excel, so I have some add-ins that let me get the specific heat constant volumes a little easier than you by hand, but you could still do it by hand. And uh, here are some of the numbers. So to cool it with constant specific heats down from state 1 to state 2 is around 10.1 versus from state 1 all the way to state 3 is around 66 kilojoules. And notice that uh, about 70% of that heat removed is due to condensing some of the vapor, making the liquid. All right. How much condensed? Around 20% of the mass that started in the vapor actually condenses. And what is the volume occupied? Infinitesimal, negligible volume the liquid occupies. So of the original 2.5 meter cubed, it's 0.0008% of that volume is now occupied by the little liquid condensate at the bottom. Or it could have condensed in little drops on the side wherever it's cold. So hopefully that makes sense. I actually throw in some omegas, humidity ratios, and you could take a look at the mass of the vapor. This is the ending mass of the vapor, the mass of the dry air. Okay.
if I go to the next page, resolved it in Excel, same essentially results, but they're not good to four significant digits. They're just in the same ballpark. I use table A2 and A22. Um, A22, and this should be A2 right there. It's just a comment to get the use for the steam, the water vapor. And that's basically the same answers. Okay. Any questions about that problem? Ready to press forward? All right. So now what we're going to do is an open system. Maybe you have a duct, and in the duct you have something, let's say a, a heating coil. And the heating coil passes hot water through it. When the air blows over it, the air is going to be hotter on the exit out of the duct after it goes across that heating coil. So when we have a system like that, we analyze it little control volume like that and what you have is you have an air balance or dry air balance and you think the mass flow rate of the dry air coming in at state one is equal to the mass flow rate of the dry air going out at state two plus or minus any additions or subtractions you know removals but does dry air condense no if we get the cryogenic temperatures, yes, but we're this is like HVAC applications. So we're not doing cryogenic temperatures, and so oxygen's not going to condense into a liquid oxygen, and nitrogen, the same thing. Okay, so a lot of times they dispense with this subscripts, and they just talk about, hey, the mass flow rate of air through the system. Now, if you have another problem where they're mixing, well then, sure, the mass flow rate of the dry air coming in at state one and the mass flow rate of the dry air coming in at state two is equal to the sum, which is the mass flow rate of the dry air going out at three. Now that's true. That sometimes you have to say, oh, there's two mass flow rates of dry air adding up, but there's no loss of dry air or there's no gain of dry air. It's, it's, it's easy to do a balance on. But water, water is a different one. You could actually have a, a coil in here and it just sprays in water. It's a humidifier. You may never have seen a humidifier. Those that maybe have lived up north where they have nine months of winter have seen humidifiers in homes. Most homes up north have them because in the nine months of winter, things get very dry in the house. Anybody experienced that where it's very, very dry? A few people, yeah. And so the easy one, we'll have it for about two weeks in San Antonio, where you walk across the carpet, you touch a doorknob, and you get a little zap. Static electricity because of the dryness. Maybe you're sleeping at night and it's very dry in the bedroom or something, and you have sheets and they're kind of fuzzy or sticky, and you peel them apart in a dark, dark night, and you can actually see the little uh, uh, static electricity. Uh, but uh, uh, that's a lack of humidity. If you put more humidity in the room, you'll get rid of that challenge. Okay, so up north, they actually have humidifiers built into their furnaces. Okay. Where they spray in something like liquid water. In building, they may spray in vapor, water vapor, boiled water, you know, steam. They could do that. It's all up. It's, it all matters. Also, if you have, you wouldn't have it in the same duct, but if you have a cooling coil, now this one you're familiar with, right? What should you have to collect, you know, a little tray on the bottom of that cooling coil so you can collect the condensate that comes off the cooling coil? And that would be like a, an M dot of the liquid coming out of that control volume if it was condensate collecting. Or here, here is a mass flow rate of liquid or some water to spray in to humidify. Again, you wouldn't do it both at the same time, but you could have it set up so you are going to dehumidify in the summer and humidify in the winter, as well as adding heat. So the heating would add heat and the cooling coil would remove heat out of the air. But let's just talk about the water balance. So I want to know what is the mass flow rate of the water coming in at one. This is where my humidity ratio pays off. 
because that's the product of omega-1 times m dot dA, isn't it? Isn't that the mass flow rate of water coming in with the moist air? Sure. That's why we like humidity ratio. And then if you had any mass flow rate of uh, um, liquid coming in, and then it would be the mass flow rate of any liquid or, or any water. It doesn't have to be liquid, but most of the time it's liquid going out. Plus, what would come out at, at the end of this control volume? That would be the mass flow rate of the water coming out at state two. Anyway, which you get the m dot liquid in equal to the mass flow rate liquid out plus omega two uh, m dot da. So, in in an, this is this is uh, often zero unless you actually have a humidifier. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. And this one happens when you have cooling. When you have a cooling of moist air, you're going to get condensate. Cooling a dry air, you can avoid it. It'll still be a dry coil. Cooling a moist air, you're going to get it. All right. So water balance, and that's where you see this omega come in. Well, let's solve this problem. We have moist air at 25C, 100 kilopascal, 27 or 75% relative humidity. It flows over a cooling coil with a dry air flow rate of 2.5 kilograms per second, and then it leaves at a given temperature and relative humidity. Let me organize the information. So it comes in, temperature is 25 degrees C. Hey, the professor just made a big deal about three different temperatures, dew point, wet bulb, dry bulb. What is that temperature? 25 degrees C what? Dry bulb. It's their standard temperature. Often we don't subscript it. It's we know what it is. It's just the inlet temperature, the dry bulb temperature. All right. Also, 100 kilopascal, it's 100 kilopascal roughly through the whole system. I'm not going to repeat that one bar. But the relative humidity coming in is 75%. And the mass flow rate of dry air through the system is 2.5 kilograms per second. Normally, they make you work hard to get that number, but here it's just given to us. Oh, the mass flow rate of dry air is 2.5 kilograms per second. On the outlet, we have temperature 2 is 12 degrees C, and we have the relative humidity is 95%. You have a cooling coil, and... You're also probably going to have some liquid condensate collected off of it, M dot liquid water. <laughs> For part A, it says, determine the volumetric flow rate of air entering the coil. They're going to ask you to calculate AV at 1. How would we calculate the volumetric flow rate coming in? Think of the mass flow rate of the dry air you're given. And so if I, um, the mass flow rate of the dry air divided by the density of the dry air, would that work? It'll work. So uh, I have to get the density of dry air. Oh, man, I've done this so many times. You've done it so many times already, right? Which equation? An ideal gas. I just got to get the partial pressure of the dry air which is the total minus the vapor pressure. I need to get the vapor pressure, relative humidity times PSAT at that temperature coming in at 1. So um, let me see if I get my notes here. So the saturation pressure at uh, 25 degrees C is uh, 3.169 kilopascal. Multiply that by 75% relative humidity, and I actually did, I, I, I left that off the notes. Sorry about that. No, I didn't. Here it is, 2.377 kilopascal. So the dry air pressure is 97.623 kilopascal. The density of the dry air is going to be the uh, partial pressure of the dry air 
molar mass of the dry air divided by the uh, R bar T. What's the density? Uh, okay, read it to me slowly. 2.19. That would be cubic meters per second. Volumetric flow rate coming in is 2.19 meters cubed per second. Let me ask this. What about going out? What is the volumetric flow rate going out? At, I should put it like this. AV at 2. Is it going to be greater than the volumetric flow rate coming in or less? Or the same? But no, they're not going to be the same because I didn't let you choose that. They're going to be close, but they're going to be a shade above or a shade below. Why is it going to be less? Because it's colder, and if it's colder, it's more <laughs> compact, it's more dense, and I don't need as high a volumetric flow rate to move the same amount of dry air through the system. That makes sense? So if I wanted to calculate the volumetric flow rate at 2, I know I didn't ask this, would that be equal to the vast flow rate of the dry air divided by the density of the dry air at 2? And isn't that the same? The only thing that changed is the density of the dry air going out at 2. And the density of the dry air going out at 2, you can see that's going to be the partial pressure of the dry air times the dry air motor mass, R bar T, what, what the temperature do at 2? What happened? It's a little colder? Is it going to be a little more dense? If you actually uh, take some water vapor out, won't it even help it be a little more dense? Yeah, from the dry air perspective. So um, basically the partial pressure of the dry air uh, will possibly go up if there's condensate and the temperature went down, both of those lead to more dense dry air. Okay. Now, let's take a look at part B. What is the condensate flow rate leaving the coil? What is this m dot liquid? How do you calculate the m dot liquid? That's music to my ears. Was, ah, do a water balance. Do a water balance for the control volume there where you have inlet and outlet and you have also the, the liquid coming out. And so what you'll end up with from a water balance is you'll have humidity ratio, inlet, the vast flow rate dry air coming in, equal to what goes out, the mass flow rate liquid, that's what I want to calculate, plus omega 2 m dot dry air. Are these two dry air flow rates the same? The mass flow rate of dry air, is that the same on it? Yeah, that's the same. So it really makes this nice simple equation. The simple equation is, is what I want to calculate, the liquid condensate flow rate out of the system is going to be omega 1 minus omega 2 times m dot dA. And that was given. So all I need is the humidity ratios, inlet and outlet. So Humidity ratio at state 1.622, PV1 divided by pressure of dry air coming in at 1. Uh, we already had the pressure of dry air coming in at 1. We had the partial pressure of the vapor. I have all the information to calculate omega 1, true? How about this? You calculate omega 1 and then uh, let me know what it is. So we calculate the uh, humidity ratio inlet is 0 0.015143, and with a little work, a humidity ratio outlet, 0 0.008396. A couple observations. A lot of times these humidity ratios are much less than one. They're, sometimes they'll even multiply by 1,000, and they'll say, how many grams of water vapor per kilogram of dry air? But otherwise, just anticipate numbers that are down there, like 0.008 or 0.01 something. And again, remind me the units. It's kilogram of vapor per kilogram of dry air, right? All right. 
Sometimes they leave it dimensionless, and they're correct if they leave it dimensionless. It's correct. But, uh, so now what we could do is calculate the mass flow rate of the liquid. And the mass flow rate of the liquid comes in about 1.01 kilogram per minute. Any questions, comments? Do okay? I have one more problem. I think I'll be able to solve it if I rush. It'll be dealing with an energy balance. And let me just start the problem and then solve it, and you'll see the energy balance just like the water balance. So we have air at 12 degrees C at a given volumetric flow rate, and 30% relative humidity is heated and humidified. So this is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, when you're humidifying it, you just bring in and spray in water into the stream. That's my rendition of spraying in water. And right here is a heating coil, so you bring in hot fluid. And when it, the air flows over it, what happens is you pick up some heat transfer into the air stream from the hot coil. Okay. So the inlet uh, conditions are the inlet temperature 12 degrees C, and the relative humidity is 30%, and exits T2, much higher temperature, 32 degrees C, and relative humidity of 40%. Not only has the percent humidity gone up, but the temperature has gone up, meaning it can hold a lot more moisture. There's a lot of moisture going out. So this is the mass flow rate of the liquid coming in or water coming in right here. Uh, the pressure is throughout the system is uh, 101.3 kilopascal and liquid water comes in at 25 degrees C so we can get its enthalpy coming in. Determine the mass flow rate of dry air entering the coil in kilograms per minute. So this is where, okay, I've got to do a little work. Mass flow rate of dry air. Would that be the mass density of dry air coming in times the volumetric flow rate coming in? And they gave me the volumetric flow rate coming in. And we've done this a couple times. Mass density of dry air coming in. Be the partial pressure of the dry air at state one, molar mass of dry air, divided by R bar T1. So let me see if I can just share with you some numbers. The, uh, I know there's a few steps, but we've done them a number of times. It's right at, um, the mass flow rate of dry air is right at 37 kilograms of dry air per minute. All right, part B, something new. What is the flow rate? Well, this is not really something new. The flow rate of liquid water supplied by the humidifier. You do a water balance, and you find that the mass flow rate of liquid coming in is equal to the mass flow rate of the dry air going through. You have the humidity ratio going out minus humidity ratio coming in. I just need to calculate that humidity ratio coming in. It turns out to be very low, 0 0.00259. Humidity ratio going out. Zero point zero one one nine, and then you can calculate the mass flow rate of the liquid that needs to be supplied. Zero point three four five kilograms per minute. So if you have a water bottle, just like this, how many kilos are in this water bottle? This is a uh, half a liter. So it's half a half a kilogram, right? So it's half a kilogram. So you need to add, uh, you know, 0.345, a third of a kilogram per minute. That's what the calculations show. Not a lot of water. It's not a fire hose. How about this? Part C, what is the rate of heat transfer to the moist air? Do an energy balance. Okay. 
you're bringing in uh, this heat transfer is being added what's happening is is you could think of three streams the mass flow rate of the dry air going through and you'll have the enthalpy going out minus enthalpy in of the dry air all right the mass flow rate of the vapor that came in just goes along for the ride but its enthalpy um, is going to go out a saturated vapor at state two which is higher than saturated vapor at state one and then the other is the liquid the liquid what's it coming um, um, this is this is a in so I've got to switch that around which is uh, no, that's fine just like that so what's it go out as HG at 2 minus how did it come in HF at the liquid state that liquid came in at 25 degrees C this is going to be a very low number it takes a lot of energy to vaporize it so what happens is you find out that you need around 26.6 kilowatts of which 47 percent just heats the dry air about nothing heats the water vapor that was coming in and the rest of it around 53 percent is to actually heat the liquid water to make it vapor when it goes out so a lot of heat transfer is required to humidify so thank you very much for your attention